Good afternoon, folks. Come on in. We've got a few more seats. It's a pleasure to see so many people here after, after lunch, even. And, and uh, Sid, Sid's even better than a cup of coffee for uh, <laughs> keeping, you, keeping you awake. But, but um, Sid's, been, Sid's our cleanup hitter. Um, he's our third alumni lifelong learning speaker uh, for, for, the, for the weekend and the, and the last one uh, of, of today. Um, anyway, we've got an alumni panel tomorrow. But Sid joined the Tuck faculty in 1993. I, I don't think he taught the 94s his first year. It would have been your second year. So the, so the uh, 99s and the 04s would have, would have seen him. And so that means a lot of, a lot of people here have not uh, seen him. But uh, Sid's one of the few faculty that's come to us. It had to come south to come to Hanover, because he's from Montreal. I don't know if we have any Canadians in the group, but he can go, he'll talk half in, in English and, ha and the other half in French, <laughs> in the same sentence, um, <laughs> even. But uh, his bio is, is um, in, the, in the packet there, but Sid's an authority on strategy and leadership. And it's a pleasure to give him to you for the next hour. Good. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, so I'm only going to speak in English, more or less, uh, as best I can. I have to say, this is probably my favorite uh, uh, type of talk to do, because no matter what I say, you're going to think I'm great, because it's tuck. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can't go wrong. So uh, over the last 10 years or so, I've been uh, uh, writing and researching and working with companies on an unusual topic. The topic is why they screw up, why things go wrong, why smart people make silly mistakes, uh, why people think in unusual ways. Uh, why, do, uh, wh why do all these great companies out there sometimes, not all, but many of them, stumble? And uh, over this period of time, I, uh, in, in trying to think this through and trying to understand why that happens, it's taken me into, in the last three or four years, taken me into the world of, of neuroscience, which is really an odd place to imagine. Uh, and I've been studying what the neuroscientists have been saying about how our brains work and how our brains process information. And I've been, lo I've been looking at the cognitive psychologists and all kinds of other crazy people. And it's amazing what happens when you start to look into that world and the types of insights that, uh, that happen. And, uh, and really what, uh, uh, what, what you need to try to understand, what I've always been interested in, in understanding is, you know, why do people do things that just, you know, you struggle and it just doesn't make sense. And does anyone know this story about the Iridium phone? Any investors there? <laughs> good, good. Andy, that's a good sign. Their portfolios are somewhat intact, that means. Uh, so let me tell you the story. This is, it's actually a brilliant idea. And it started back in the, um, I guess, around nine, late 1980s. Uh, the idea was that two people could communicate via mobile phone no matter where they were in the world. You can be in, uh, in Alaska and you can be in Australia, and you can communicate via mobile phone because you're using satellites and not uh, cell towers. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool idea. But along the way, a number of decisions were made uh, and, and additional decisions were made to keep doubling down and doubling down on this investment, so much so that it ended up leading to a real disaster. And I, I, hope, I hope you can see some of the problems that emerged, if you can see that photo. That is the smallest version of the phone they were ever able to <laughs> manufacture. Um, it also uh, would not work in this room. Uh, actually, that's not saying much, but it wouldn't work in this room or any room uh, in any building anywhere in the world because you had to be outside with a direct line of sight to the satellite. And you remember those old movies from World War II where you see the soldiers in the field and they have to unpack their, their, their transmitter packs and line it up? Well, the earliest versions of the Iridium phone were actually that type. Uh, quite a, quite a uh, difference from our Blackberries and our iPhones and, and all the rest. But probably the biggest uh, obstacle, the biggest problem that occurred with the Iridium phone is illustrated by, by this quick anecdote where I was in Australia, of all places, and giving a speech to you know, an audience of business people there. And uh, during the Q&A, somebody raises their hand and says, Professor, you have it all wrong. Me and my mates, we love the Iridium phone. So I look at him and I say, well, sir, uh, uh, what do you do for a living? And he says, well, I'm a ranger in the outback. And I'm thinking, well, okay, you know, I could imagine that. And then I asked him, well, how many mates are we talking about? 
And he says, including me? Yes, including you. And he says, three. <laughs> and you know what I said? I said, that more or less accounts for the total market share they're ever able to achieve. <laughs> because you know what? For a small segment of the market, this was a blockbuster product. I mean, it's used today. A version of it is used today in, in Iraq and Afghanistan on oil drilling platforms. So it had a role. But for the mass audience, uh, never going to work. And actually, they spent $5 billion with a B. So that's a big number, not an M. $5 billion on this, uh, um, uh, on this uh, project. And, uh, and of course, they went, uh, they went out of business. Uh, along the way, a lot of decisions were made, decisions that are hard to understand. Um, because you know when you, um, uh, when you spend $5 billion, usually you write more than one check, uh, m more than one wire transfer. And any time you send a satellite into space, you're writing a really big check, I think. I mean, I assume there's a lot of zeros behind that. And, uh, and so a lot of decisions were made. Uh, data was piling up, data indicating this is not working. There are big problems here, but nobody was willing to pay attention to that. And that really is, is kind of the motivation for a lot of this work that I've, been, uh, that I've been doing. I'm trying to understand why, why did Dick Fold refuse to sell Lehman Brothers until it was too late? I mean, why, why did Ken Lewis of Bank of America overpay for, uh, for Merrill Lynch? What about Bernie Madoff? And why did so many people, smart people, invest with Bernie? Why was the federal government so slow to respond to Hurricane Katrina? Um, why are so many 100-year-old or 200-year-old newspapers going out of business? Uh, why, do so many, why did so many bankers keep doubling down on subprime? And really the question is, why do seemingly good leaders make bad decisions? And that's the question. Uh, that's the question I've been asking myself as I've gone around the world giving speeches on some of the earlier work and trying to understand. And that's what took me to the world of, of neuroscience, because I think there are some interesting answers there. And uh, uh, maybe this is the shorthand answer for you right here. Uh, <laughs> You know, I could write a book for, of 300 pages, but Gary Larson in one cartoon trumps me every time. <laughs> Our brains are wired for action. That's really the story. We're wired for action. And by that, I mean uh, through evolution, through years and years of changes to, to, to what is needed for survival, uh, we act quickly. And the neuroscientists and others have discovered two things that are going on at the same time. Number one, we call one plan at a time. One plan at a time means rather than, well, think about this. What's the classic decision-making model you may have learned you know, years ago somewhere or other, or that you maybe even assume you follow today? You know, uh, let's identify the problem or the goals. Let's start to collect some data and analyze the data. Let's um, identify a set of alternatives. And let's weigh them, pros, cons, costs, benefits, and then make the, you know, choose the, the best solution, the optimal solution. Well, it turns out that people don't do that. It turns out that actually we often think we do that, but we know what the answer is before we even start it, if we really thought about it a lot. And sometimes we cook the books, fooling ourselves. Other times we're not even aware we're doing it. This one plan at a time dominates. And when that one plan at a time no longer works, sometimes we shift off of that and do something else. And other times we decide to destroy ourselves and our companies, and sometimes our lives, by continuing to follow that one plan at a time. We do that all the time. And now there is overwhelming evidence from the neuroscientists and others uh, uh, for this. And what we've tried to do is see whether this really makes sense in the business world, and, and we think it does. The other, the other phenomenon is this, what we call emotional tagging. So the, the way I think about this is, imagine in, your, um, um, in all of our brains we have a filing cabinet, a file cabinet. And whenever we have a problem or a situation or a challenge or a decision to make, what do we do? Our brain quickly files through that, goes through that filing cabinet, and picks a couple of the folders that are sticking out a little bit more. And what are those folders? Where, well, one of the folders might say, don't screw up again because your boss is not going to put up with that again. Another folder might say, you know, the last time you tried this, it didn't work. Let's not do this. And probably the biggest folder says, let's keep doing what made us successful in the past. And so we have these emotions that drive a lot of our decision making in a very powerful way, much more so than we, we think. And most of us, especially in a place like Tuck where we teach you know, strategic decision making and all kinds of things like this, we, we, we take pride in helping our students understand what that means and how to develop themselves as critical thinkers, strategic thinkers, and we do that. But the reality is that emotions are extremely, extremely powerful. And those emotions drive our behavior. And what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes or so is give you a bunch of examples that illustrate exactly that. Because really what happens is 
people make decisions so often on the basis of what Malcolm Gladwell called, uh, called Blink, right? How many of you read that book, Blink? Quite a few. You know, if you haven't read the book, basically the thesis is people make quick decisions, and often it works. And if you read the book, you may remember many, many instances of you know, intuitive decision-making, straight from the gut type of decision-making, quick decisions, and all sorts of examples like that, uh, often with good results. But there's also some examples in, in the book where uh, that intuitive, quick, blink decision-making also led to disaster. Um, and so the, 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 the problem at the end of blink is you never really know when it's good and when it's bad. And that's kind of important to know, don't you think? When is it good to stick with the gut? and to rely on intuition and experience. And when does it make sense to take a step back, to think again, if you will, and start to be a little bit more process-oriented, a little bit more analytical? And the purpose of our book, Think Again, and the work we've been doing, in some ways, is to try to answer that, that question. So let me illustrate, first off, how sometimes this one plan at a time can actually work. And I want to illustrate it with good old Sully, who is now back on the job, as we, uh, as we just heard, right? Captain Chesley Sullenberger, you remember this story, no doubt, right? Pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing story. Um, um, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 takes off from LaGuardia. Uh, as it's uh, lifting off, a flock of birds get caught in the engines, incapacitate the engines. Captain Sullenberger, Sully, instantly knows what he needs to do. He has one plan at a time, and that one plan at a time is to turn around the ship, turn around the, the airplane, and, and get back to uh, LaGuardia Airport. He doesn't form a committee to talk about this. <laughs> he doesn't have a debate with his co-pilot. He certainly doesn't ask the passengers what they think. <laughs> he knows what he needs to do because he's got the right, the, 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 the right experience and the intuition, and he knows what he needs to do. But you know what happens? That one plan at a time, changes within a matter of seconds. Because if you remember, this is the aircraft. It's, it's turning around. It's over the Hudson. And if you remember, um, he realizes he's not going to, uh, it's not going to be easy to get all the way to LaGuardia. Let's find an airport that's a little closer. And that was, uh, that was Teterboro, right, in, in, in New Jersey. And so instantly, again, he comes up with his second one plan at a time. And that is, let's divert to Teterboro Airport rather than LaGuardia. Again. No committee, no discussion, no debate, no asking the passengers. Off he goes. He knows what to do. And then, you know, that's going on for a few seconds. And then, remarkably, there's a, there's a third one plan at a time that happens because he realizes that plan's not going to work. And if you remember the, uh, the exchange here, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing. This is with flight control. Um, he's given uh, permission to land on runway one at Teterboro. And Sullenberger says, we can't do it. And so the flight controller says, OK, which runway would you like at Teterboro? <laughs> and he says, we're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again? You could just imagine what that was like, right? But instantly, he knows that he's not going to get to Teterboro. He's going to have to try to land that craft, miraculously, as it turns out, on the Hudson. And he does. Each time, one plan at a time. No deep analytical discussion. Quick decision making. And actually, you know, I, I, I mentioned before, you know, we're wired for action. If you think about this, you know, if our ancestors saw a tall striped animal bounding towards them in the tall grass, and they decided to get together the, the tribal elders and debate it and think about it, they wouldn't be around to pass their genes along to all of us. They needed to know instantly what to do. Now, the world is a little bit more complex today, and those instant knowing what to do is not nearly as easy as it maybe was millennia ago. And, uh, and so that one plan at a time is really a lot more complex. So it worked beautifully for Sullenberg. And you know, luck was on his side, and the gods looked down, and it was a wonderful story. But let's, uh, let's think about Captain Sullenberger. And let's think about his experience. Well, he was an experienced pilot, right? That was good. He was an experienced accident investigator. And to top it all off, you know, he was a certified glider pilot. So I don't know about you, but this is the guy I would have liked to have on the aircraft if I was stuck in that situation. He had it all. He had all of the right experience. And the question I have for you is, how often is it the case that your experience base is so closely aligned to the situation or challenge that you're facing? And how often is it the case that we assume or extend or expand our, our belief or our perception of the quality of our experience base to believe that it could do much more than it actually does. 
And I, and, and I venture to guess that happens, uh, that happens a lot. And, and this is one of those things that's a little bit uncomfortable because really what I'm saying is your experience as leaders, as managers, as, as people in the community might not be the right thing. And that's a tough message to experience people because experience is currency. It's what you're all about. Uh, it might be, it might not be, but you can't assume that it's automatically going to be. And so when experience has this tight fit, really tight fit with, our, uh, with the situation we're facing, intuition, go for it. Gut instinct, quick decision making, all of that stuff makes sense because you got that perfect match. But very often it doesn't. And actually, what makes this more difficult, what makes it more difficult is that, you know, if you're facing a situation in business, or in life for that matter, that is really, really different from your experience base. You know, you got to be a kind of a crazy egomaniac to think you can figure it all out yourself. You're going to bring in some experts, some other people, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to get alternative data, you're going to try to understand it better. So in a way, we could say that these far off mismatches between experience and, our, and the situation we're facing, actually they don't hurt us as much because most people will be aware enough to realize, you know, we don't quite have it. We got we to bring in somebody who knows more about this. The real big problems, the biggest problems occur when there's a close but not close enough fit between experience and the situation we're facing. And, uh, um, and I'll tell you that this is one of those things that appears in a lot of areas of business. For example, I've studied mergers and acquisitions for a long, long time. And one of the things that, uh, uh, that I looked at is, uh, actually it's a type of question only an academic would love. I asked the question, uh, do experienced uh, executives and experienced companies, do they do better at m and I mean, talk about a stupid question, right? I mean, how could they not do better? But in fact, it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex. Let me, uh, let me see if I can actually draw it. Since I'm supposed to be a teacher, I should use a board every now and then. Here, let me show you what, uh, uh, what it looks like. This is the relationship between number of mergers and acquisitions, which is the measure of experience we used, and this is uh, different measures of the performance of an acquisition. That was, the, that was the, really what we were studying. And of course, you know, if you, um, if you have a naive view, you figure, whoops, you figure the more experience you have, the better you do. Or if you know something about how people learn, you understand it doesn't quite work that way. There's something called the learning curve. And so many uh, areas of life actually resemble, the learning curve is a, is a really good match for what really goes on in terms of how people develop knowledge. And that looks like, uh, let's see, that looks something like this. Kind of takes a little bit of time and then takes off quick learning and then it starts to slow down because you're not going to get any better at that, at that point. Um, uh, what we found actually, I got to mark it in red, uh, is something that looks closer to this. And that's not meant to be a happy face uh, either if you're uh, running the business and you're over here, right? Uh, and the point of inflection is at eight. That's a big number, right? That's eight acquisitions. That means on average, you will actually destroy shareholder value with each acquisition you make up until the eighth when it starts to turn around. That's what that says. Now, of course, there's exceptions to every rule, but this is what the pattern indicate. And uh, uh, those of you who, uh, who, who have studied M&A or have been involved in M&A know this is a tough, tough uh, game to play. Why does this happen? To me, what we're talking about is the answer to why this happens. We know what we did in the first acquisition. Some things worked, some things didn't. And the next acquisition, we try to apply that basic model. Turns out that basic model is not quite right because the next acquisition is a little bit different. And it takes two or three or four, actually eight different deals until you start to build up the knowledge. So in each one of these cases, the experience base is just a little bit, a little bit off and we don't quite get that. So is experience a good thing? The answer is it depends on whether there's this close fit between the challenge or the situation we're facing. And our experience base. Let's look at when experience gets into this kind of dangerous zone where there's a bit of a fit but not quite. Um, if, you, uh, if you think about what happened to, uh, to Lehman Brothers, I mean a lot happened to Lehman Brothers and we're only going to talk about one small part of it, but uh, during the, uh, the, the financial crisis, um, it's actually not much more than a year ago, it was September 13th, 14th weekend that a lot of this kind of came to, came to a head. Um, Dick Fold was going around the, the country trying to uh, retain the independence of Lehman Brothers. Um, he did everything he could not to find a business partner. And why did he do that? Because to a large extent he had his experience of long-term capital management. 
And do you remember LTCM back in, um, actually 10 years earlier, 1998, that was that um, big hedge fund, you know, Nobel Prize winning, uh, Nobel Prize winners in finance created this hedge fund and it blew up, which, you know, if you're going to have Nobel Prize winners in finance doing that, you'd have to expect that result to happen. Um, <laughs> if they were Nobel Prize winners in strategy or leadership, it might be a little different, but okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, LTCM blows up. Uh, Lehman is actually uh, in a variety of different counterparty relationships with LTCM, and they, um, um, and they, get, they make it through. Dick Fold becomes a legend within, uh, within Lehman for retaining the independence of the company and getting through the whole thing. And fast forward 10 years to last year, and what happens? Well, you know, you have another financial crisis, and actually Dick Fold goes around to different Lehman offices around the country, and he says, you know, we got through LTCM, and we're going to get through this. He was adopting exactly the same mindset, exactly the same uh, logic of retaining independence, even though the situation last year, in terms of the financial crisis, was dramatically more severe than it was 10 years earlier. So is experience a good thing? Uh, again, sometimes, but let's not overstate it. So this is kind of our, our summary of the four key questions you want to ask yourself when you think about making better quality decisions. Are your personal experiences misleading you? Are your personal experiences with LTCM misleading you when you're dealing with, um, uh, with Lehman Brothers? Uh, is your personal self-interest clouding your thinking? Have you made a dangerous prejudgment? And are inappropriate attachments pushing you in the wrong direction? I'm going to illustrate each of the other three questions now with an additional example because we just talked about experience a little bit and I want you to get a sense of you know, why is this an important question. And let's start with self-interest. Let's start with self-interest. It is no surprise to anyone here that self-interest is part of everyday life. In fact, you know, if we know anything about evolution and survival, of course we're going to be self-interested. All of us have seen self-interested behavior. That's not a big deal. I think what is surprising is how incredibly powerful this self-interest turns out to be and maybe even more important than that, how, how it operates at a subconscious level. In other words, we don't know that we're behaving in a self-interested manner many, in many instances. We think that we're being above board and fair, but actually we're not because it operates at this subconscious level, which means you know, we're not formally processing this and our brains are not formally processing this. Let me give you, let me, let me give you a classic example of this. Um, um, there were a group of accountants that came back to, uh, to business school to do an uh, executive education uh, program. Uh, these are all experienced accountants from you know, the big, how many are there left now? Three, four, one, twenty, whatever they are. They, they come back and they're there for a whole week doing different activities, different exercises, different lessons. One of the lessons, one of the exercises was a case study in forensic accounting. And so everyone in the entire class got this case study on forensic accounting. Financial statements are there and their job was to identify all the things that were questionable. Disclosure problems, uh, misstatements, um, whatever, whatever they thought could be, could be potentially uh, dangerous or questionable. That was, their, that was their assignment. But it turns out that one half of the class was given one additional piece of information that the other half was not given. And this other half, all of you, were told, we have an opportunity to do significant follow-on work with this client. And that was the only other line that they got. <laughs> they all go off. They spend a couple hours in the study group, you know, working on it. Remember those days, right? Study group working on it. Come back, present, and guess what happens? The group that was told we have the opportunity for some substantial follow-on work found significantly fewer accounting mistakes, restatements, disclosure questions, and all the rest. And we have to put this into perspective a little bit, right? Is, is there really any opportunity for future work? We're in the classroom. It's not a real company. <laughs> there is no real money on the table. I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre, really. There's nothing on the table. There's no real gain that is at all possible. You are in the classroom doing an exercise in the classroom. And uh, imagine that. And actually, when the re results were shared with the entire class, reported back to the class, the group that, was, that found significantly fewer uh, accounting mistakes, they stopped the entire class. They refused to believe that the other group had the same case study. <laughs> and they, they started to check through, you know, rifle through the pages of the case study to make sure the financial statements were, were the same. They didn't believe it even after confronted with the data that they had done what they had done. That's how powerful self-interest really is, even when there's no money on the table. Imagine when there's real money. 
it operates at a very, very powerful uh, level. And you know, there's lots and lots of examples. Uh, John Thane's redecoration of his office, you know. Does anyone really think that he sat around with his advisors and, and said, let's spend as much money as we can on all sorts of things uh, just to uh, kind of have bad publicity in the time of the financial crisis going on? You know, John Thane's one of the great leaders in, in, financial, in financial services. There's no way he thought about anything like this. It's impossible to believe that. It's just that this is the way the world worked. There's a degree of, of entitlement. Um, Self-interest is implicit in a lot of what goes on in Wall Street, and nobody questions it. Nobody asks questions about it. Nobody thinks about it. It is the way it is. And, and so things that sound like crazy to the average person are not even debated or discussed in that situation in Wall Street. And actually, I have a little bit of sympathy because he, he got these one pair of guest chairs for $87,000. And if I'm going to visit the office, I want to sit on one of those chairs. But <laughs> Otherwise, I think you know, the other stuff's a little bit pricey. <laughs> Self-interest in action. OK. Misleading prejudgments. That's Rick Wagner from General Motors. Uh, it's unfair to just put Rick Wagner up there, actually, because the GM problem goes back 25 years, if not, lo if not longer. Uh, what's a misleading prejudgment? Here's one you've all done, maybe multiple times, maybe many times in one day. It is when you decide that the world is the way it is. and doesn't matter what happens afterwards, you stick to that. You stick to that idea or that conclusion. We do that in everyday life all the time. And sometimes we do it and we end up with uh, problems at home, sometimes problems in the business. We refuse to, to budge off of an early prejudgment and a, a set of assumptions we make about how the world works, what the solution is, without ever. And it doesn't matter what the data, but it doesn't matter what the data are. In fact, what happens is you look for data that is confirming. And what do you do with data that's not consistent? Dismiss it, ignore it, sometimes shoot the messenger. Now we have unfortunately too many of those examples in public and business life in the last few years. Um, misleading prejudgments, very, very powerful, very powerful because that is kind of, we do, we, every one of us has done this. It's not like you know, just some CEO has done this or some political le leader has done that. Everyone has done it at some point in time. But when you're a leader of an organization, or more so leader of, of a governmental entity, the cost involved in sticking to these prejudgments is disastrous. Misleading prejudgments. Fourth and finally, these inappropriate attachments. You know who that is? Jerry Yang, right? Jerry Yang. He is the uh, founder and was the CEO of, uh, of Yahoo. And you remember what happened with Yahoo about a year ago? They had, a, they had an offer. Microsoft made him a little offer to buy the company. Just a little, little offer. Um, and uh, Jerry Yang, chairman of the board at the time as well, founder, CEO of Yahoo, guy who built the company, said, no, that's not good enough. And so he, uh, he pushed, and actually Microsoft offered a little bit more. They raised their, their bid. And he kept pushing, says, no, we're better than that. And eventually Microsoft actually took their, took their marbles and went home. And they said, no, this is too pricey for me. If you look at the difference in the market value, or the valuation, that um, was based on the Microsoft offer and the value of Yahoo stock after Microsoft went home. You know what the difference was? It's 30 billion with a B dollars. Again, that's the big letter, the B, right? Not the M. 30 billion dollars. I mean, that's unbelievable. And that's not good enough? Why did that happen? I, I'm not in Jerry Yang's head. I can't guarantee you that what I'm about to say is accurate. But here's what I think. I think he had an inappropriate attachment to Yahoo and actually an inappropriate detachment, if you will, to Microsoft. Because imagine, you're in Silicon Valley, you built this great company, you're a legend, you're in the cover of Fortune and Business Week, and you go and sell your company to Microsoft? How are you going to hang around the Silicon Valley bars anymore? And, uh, <laughs> when you go to the conferences, and next time you see Steve Jobs, what are you going to say to him? I mean, it's, it'd be bad. It's not a good thing. We can't sell our business that we built. Not only that, but to sell it to Microsoft, of all companies. Microsoft, I mean, the evil empire in, uh, in Silicon Valley, in the, in the computer business. Today, people will, soon people will say Google is the evil empire, but whoever's the biggest always gets pinned with that, right? Um, to sell it to Microsoft of all companies, I think this attachment to your own company, to keep it no matter what, and not to sell it to someone else because of who they are, has a big part to play in this entire situation with, uh, with, uh, with, with Yahoo. And you know, there's 30 billion reasons why we need to spend some time thinking about inappropriate attachments. These things happen, you know, all walks of life. I think the, the, these attachments are in some ways the most, uh, the, the most difficult to deal with because these are attachments to people, to places, 
to things, to companies, and they are, in some ways, the things that make the world go round. I mean, it's about attachments to people we care about, that we love, that are partners of ours, that are friends, that are businesses we've grown up with, that we've worked, and, and, and it, it takes place in all sorts of different ways. And in fact, um, we, 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 got, we got too many examples, don't we? This is Madoff. Never was a better last name designed than what he did. Madoff. Um, you know, and, uh, but you know, he just followed the same Ponzi, Ponzi scheme um, um, playbook as everyone else, which is you insinuate yourself into a community, you get well known with that community, whatever that happens to be, and you build this trust, so much so that people will just do whatever you, whatever you want. They won't ask the obvious tough questions. You know, when you looked at that list of uh, big investors in, uh, with, 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 uh, uh, with, with Madoff, you had people that were senior executives at J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley. Did, the, did they know anything about due diligence and financial statements and financial services? How could they not? If they had looked, they would have known they did not look. And actually, at the risk of some personal embarrassment, I'll give you my own little example. Luckily, not in this league. Um, I'm just a professor, after all. But uh, I, I'll give you a little, a little uh, local, local story. Um, um, a few years ago, it's now maybe 10 years ago, uh, there's, a, there's a guy that came into town um, that had a vision of building a health club, a world-class health club. Um, and he said he had done it before, actually in the state of Maine. And, and was very accomplished at all this. And you know where he went to try to get to know the, the people around town? Uh, he, he went to Luz. And where else are you going to go? That's where the movers and shakers, such as they are, uh, you know, in Hanover hang out. And he'd have breakfast with you know, the di different folks at, at Luz. And over time, connections were being made. And what he was doing was building a community of people that would begin to, and actually did, trust him. And then he, has, he enrolls or unveils his vision of this great health club. And it turns out, you know, people are starting to invest as limited partners, including, unfortunately, myself. Um, and, you know, I had an attachment to this, to this person. Uh, and so I never looked into his background. I never checked the Better Business Bureau. If I had, I would have seen numerous complaints against him. Um, I never checked any legal documentation because there was a restraining order against him in the state of Maine. And the list goes on. I didn't do any of that because I believed the guy. I trusted the guy. Luckily, it was a very small number. Uh, no, nonetheless, the same thing happened because of the power of these attachments. And that's why I think it's one of the most, one of the most difficult ones of, of all, because it's so easy to fall into this, to fall into this trap, uh, inappropriate uh, attachments. So let me put it all together with one powerful and very disturbing example that we look at in the book that actually illustrates all of these things together, and it's, it's Hurricane Katrina. This is Matthew Broderick. Maybe not the one you're used to seeing. Uh, I don't think any relation either, for that matter. Uh, he is, or was, the director of operations in the Department of Homeland Security. And his job was to monitor all the information coming in throughout any domestic uh, disturbance or terrorist activity, no matter where it was. He was sitting in Washington. He had staff all over the place. And uh, FEMA reported to him. And so his job was monitor all the data, figure out what's going on, and then make a recommendation to the White House on whether or not the federal government needs to be much more proactive in addressing a potential problem or a real problem. That was his job. Uh, his background was tremendous, four-star Marine general. I mean, we owe a lot as a nation to people who have contributed the way he has in his, in his life. Uh, he was, for example, in Darfur and Bosnia. Um, he was, as a young Marine, on the roof of the U.S. Embassy in 1975 in Vietnam, as those last helicopters were leaving. I mean, a remarkable track record. Uh, tremendous, uh, tremendous success in his career. And after he retired, this is the job that he, that he took on. And on the face of it, it looks like the right, the right person. Um, let's, uh, let's take a look at what happened. Um, this is the satellite imagery of the hurricane. It's just uh, chilling even now to look at the power of, of, of that. Friday, FEMA highlights a concern. New Orleans is below sea level. Now, why FEMA had to highlight that concern is a little bit unclear. That did not change in the days preceding Hurricane Katrina. <laughs> Nonetheless, they pointed that out. Uh, Katrina hits Monday morning. The first reports of the levees breaching, 8.30 in the morning. Um, by 6 p.m., Broderick issues his report. This is the Secretary Chertoff, Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the levees have not breached, and he goes home. So all day long, he's collecting data, but that's his conclusion at the end of the day. The levees have not breached. 
Overnight, more information is coming in, more things are happening in the city and in the area. And uh, 6 a.m., Broderick staff issues a new report, multiple breaches, the downtown is now flooded. Uh, Broderick hears of this report as he's driving in in the morning in D.C. into his office. And as soon as he gets to the office, he just laces into his staff for issuing this report without his pre-approval. And what he does is he quickly sends an email to Chertoff and he says, the 6 a.m. report may have been exaggerated. We're still looking into it. And during the day, he continues to look into it, continues to collect data, and then finally by 2.30 in the afternoon, Broderick confirms the levies of breach, and it's at that point that he officially recommends to the White House that the federal government becomes much more proactive in addressing this. Obviously, it's not just a little bit late, it's horribly uh, late. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to give the impression this is the only thing that went wrong. Local and state problems occurred. There were a lot of problems. But we're talking about the decision making of a, of a leader and what we could learn from what happened uh, that, that can help all of us. And I think this describes some of the, some of the events. Let me illustrate the four questions that I suggested are important ones in the case of Broderick and just highlight one or two things. First of all, he didn't have the right knowledge base, so his experience base was off. He didn't really understand, you know, that New Orleans was be mostly below sea level. Um, he didn't know that the Superdome and the Convention Center were different. And, and by the way, n a major hurricane in New Orleans is one of the 15 most uh, likely scenarios that the, the Department of Homeland Security was training for. Um, it was on their list. Um, he thought that a Florida hurricane wasn't much different than a New Orleans hurricane. He didn't understand actually that there's huge differences in socioeconomic background, differences in experience with hurricanes, and you know also differences with, uh, um, uh, with geography. I mean, most of Florida is above sea level and most of New Orleans is, is not. The impact is of course much, much greater. And he talked about you know, the fog of war. We know a lot about what he thought and what he said because he testified to Congress afterwards at length. So there's, there's quite a, uh, a paper trail that, uh, that, that, that you can look at. And he actually testified to Congress when he was asked about his experience. He, he actually said, been there, done that. And you know, in some ways he had been there. He had been in some amazing places and done amazing work. But it wasn't the same as a, as a hurricane in New Orleans. It wasn't the same as a military battlefield. It wasn't at all the same. But the assumption was made that his experience base was the right one. Self-interest, he didn't want to look bad passing information, inaccurate information to the White House. Those turf battles with, you know, Michael Brown, you remember him from FEMA, that became quite, uh, quite well known. We saw Michael Brown on, uh, on Larry King uh, while all this was going on. Um, in fact, FEMA used to report directly to uh, Secretary Chertoff with the reorganization. FEMA was then reporting to Matthew Broderick. He didn't, uh, uh, Ma um, um, Michael Brown, the head of FEMA, didn't like that idea, and so he never reported to, um, um, to Matthew Broderick. He didn't give him the information. Prejudgments were very powerful here. Uh, very early on, Broderick made a prejudgment that this hurricane would be, uh, Katrina would be quote unquote a normal hurricane. It would be a normal hurricane. And he stuck to that. And that's what happens. Remember what I said about prejudgments. You make a, uh, you, you make a, uh, you, you determine the world is the way it is, and then you stick with it no matter what the data say. And so actually he testified that in his uh, office he had CNN on, and they were showing uh, one, uh, one day, I think on, on the Monday, they were showing uh, a bunch of people in the French Quarter in New Orleans. They were dancing and partying in the streets, drinking. Well, that could be any day of the week in New Orleans, but they, they showed that uh, and they said uh, they dodged a bullet. And he, uh, he testifies in his testimony to Congress. He says, what did you expect me to think? They were, as I described, having this great time in New Orleans in the, in the French Quarter. Now, it turns out that the French Quarter is one of, the, one of the places within New Orleans that is not below sea level, but above sea level a rather important uh, fact. Uh, but he, he takes that data and absorbs that and gets influenced by, by that, a TV report, at the same time that he is really disregarding dozens and dozens and dozens of other reports that are coming in about what's going on, about the levees breaching and about all sorts of other things. And he, uh, he really put a huge emphasis on, uh, on the levees, but also the, um, the Army Corps of Engineers, which I suppose makes sense. The Army Corps of Engineers were real experts in the area. But the Army Corps of Engineers actually built the levees and were, were responsible for the maintenance of those levees. And they would not necessarily be the first people to say that, they're, that those levees were not working as well as they should. And they were trying to fix them in, 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 in real time. So again, a prejudgment means you stick to, the, you stick to that data. Um, 
Other data that comes in, you ignore it or disregard it, and you latch onto a data point such as that CNN story that says, you know, you, 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 you've got it right. And then finally, attachments. You know the thing that triggered his, um, uh, his decision to notify Chertoff that, you know, the levees had breached? There was one key event that happened, and that was that an Army colonel commandeered a helicopter and flew directly over the levees and called Broderick from the helicopter to describe what he was seeing. And of course, at that point, they had been really collapsed. And it was only at that point when he had gotten this direct, high-level, military source of data that he, that he really trusted that uh, pushed him over the line in terms of deciding that you know, this really had hit the, hit, the, hit the stage. Now, again, a lot of things happened. This is just one part, but an important part of what happened with Hurricane Katrina. And, and it really highlights for us, you know, we all make decisions in everyday life all the time. We make decisions in, in work and in business, and some of them have huge, huge impact. Many of them have huge, huge impact. And how often are we asking the types of questions that we're talking about here? So where are we at? People make decisions based on emotions. That's kind of what we know, and we tend to really underestimate that. Uh, a lot of people prefer to say, no, that's not true at all, but it is, and the data now are overwhelming. Red flag conditions are really early warning signs when these four uh, uh, questions that I talked about, experience and self-interest and prejudgments and attachments, when they're in place, uh, you need to be much more analytical. You need to install a variety of safeguards. The good news is these safeguards are not really rocket science. They involve bringing in different points of view, getting, getting um, uh, experts around the table, uh, spending a little bit more time analyzing, monitoring in real time what you're doing, more effective oversight. In, in the book, there's long checklists. I mean, there's, there's no rocket science to that. We kind of know what we need to do. We just, we just, don't, we just don't do that. And, so finally, good governance decisions, good, uh, good decision governance, um, all important decisions should really have a red flags analysis. I'm starting to work with companies where we're doing this, we're experimenting with this, and you know, the first reaction is we can't be so bureaucratic. We can't spend all this time. And, and you know what I say to that? I say, you're right, we don't want to be. You can do this, your first level, in 10 or 15 minutes, that's not a lot of time to invest, and you'll have, a, you'll have a sense right at that level, if you have some of the right people in the room, you'll be, you'll, you'll be going along the path of trying to assess just how serious the problem is. And it turns out, if there are none of these red flag conditions, why slow down? Why, why bog yourself down in, in meetings and discussions and analysis? That, again, remember the question blink. That's when blink makes sense, when we don't have these red flag conditions. That's when it makes sense to be intuitive to rely on, our, rely on our gut. When those red flag ex, uh, conditions do exist, that's when we need to take the step back. And, um, uh, and actually, it could be as simple as this. You take an index card, you write down those four questions that we talked about, and you just bring that into the next time you're at a meeting where an important decision is being, is being made. Uh, and I'm not saying it's gonna solve the problem, because as I mentioned, in many instances, a lot of these things operate at a subconscious level. And that's why sometimes we're not as aware as we can be of this. You know, what, what do we really do about this? You know, at the, end, at the end of the day, to me, it speaks to one of the oldest, uh, um, uh, oldest ideas that, that people in, uh, in uh, that, that you'll find in, in great literature, you'll find in the Bible, you'll find in a lot of other places about self-monitoring and self-awareness. People that are self-aware are much more able to be in a position to realize and assess in real time that they may be doing something uh, that, that, that they shouldn't. It's not a foolproof method. That's why you need other people. That's why you need other methods, uh, these, these safeguards as I talk about. But you know, uh, uh, self-awareness self is, is really about trying to take that step back and being aware of what we're doing in real time so that we, could take, we, we, we can make some adjustments when there's still time to, uh, there's still time to, uh, to, to adjust. So you know, um, thinking again is, is possible. Uh, making good decisions is possible. In fact, there are many people who make good decisions all the time. But you know, when we start to study this and start to spend time with, with executives and start to analyze things in a little bit more detail, you discover you know, some of these problems are really fundamental to who we are as human beings. And we're not going to solve them all, but at least if we're on the alert for them, we have an opportunity to do something about that. We could become more self-aware. We could install some appropriate safeguards. But most important of all, and if you get nothing else out of the, out of the hour we're spending together, I hope you'll get this. There are four questions you could ask. They're not complicated questions. You could ask them, and you could ask them in any situation. And if you train yourself, and it's not exactly complicated training, you can put yourself in a position to make that part of your thought process as you're going through any decision. And, and it gets you at least at the beginning of the path to trying to figure all of this out. And on that note, let me thank you very much for your attention.
And and actually, there's a few minutes, and I'm happy to take uh, take questions on this topic or or anything else uh, that you want to talk about. Right? We have I forgot a few. to mention um, in the introduction for Sid, which is not exactly on this topic at all. Maybe if I Sid was our was our Tuck School representative on the Presidential Search Committee for the um, for the search that ended as of one July when President Kim uh, was king. <laughs> just got inaugurated a couple of weeks ago, so I, I didn't want to change the subject, but I apologize for, for not uh, mentioning that. So if people had a question about uh, the talk or Sid's view of the new president, I'm sure he, since we're, the, the tape's off now. Yeah, we're all, we're all friends, I'll, I'll tell you. Ernie? <laughs> Weren't you a Tuck scholar here? <laughs> we'll go back and find those for you, right at the beginning. Whoops, whoops. There we go. You got it. That was an easy question. Yes? When you look at this, would you look at a difference of how gender approaches this question? Yeah, I've had that question a few, a few times. And, uh, uh, Certainly there are people that will say that uh, women are uh, generally a little bit more self-aware and alert to what's going on around them. I didn't see any difference in my data, but there are other people that have studied this in different, different ways that might suggest that, that, that women uh, may have some advantage, if you will, with respect to not falling into these traps. But I didn't see that. Uh, to be fair, though, most of the companies and leaders that I studied were, were male. So it wasn't a, an equal, by any means, equal balance. Um, so there might be something there. Yeah. Yes? A question about Don Delaney. Perhaps this is an unfair question, but clearly Yang had, a, had an attachment to this company. But it was no longer his company. It was a publicly held company. And there was a board of directors involved in assessing you know, Microsoft's bid. How is it that that result? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's a... Uh, um, he was the chair, he was the founder, but, you know, was a publicly traded company. He didn't own, he didn't own the thing, he didn't, uh, but, you know, boards of directors are boards of directors, aren't they? And they are vulnerable, especially to a lot of these types of things. And uh, this was a board that he controlled. Uh, he dominated, to be, to be more accurate. And they weren't going to go against what he, what he wanted. Uh, you know, that's why there's, among other reasons, why, why we have venture capitalists. They come in and they get rid of the founders, I mean, right? Nobody's going to get rid of them otherwise. They'll stay there forever. Boards of directors are very, are historically, meaning over the last 10, 20 years, rather ineffective in, in general. And you know, it's, it, it is, it, I mean, there have been a lot of lawsuits. I don't know quite what's happened with all of them, but it is a breach of fiduciary responsibility. If you have a chance to create value for your shareholders, that's $30 billion more than what you otherwise could do. I mean, is there any strategy Yahoo can come up with that will generate $30 billion in value? And that's, by the way, $30 billion you're getting right away, present value. You know, start, try generating that over a 10-year time period and see what we're talking about. It's, it, maybe, you know, maybe, but I wouldn't bet on it. So the board, the board was complicit in this. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of my, uh, my personal experience. I can think of dozens of situations where the answer to these four questions is yes. And in some cases, companies are in fact staring at the wrong decision. And in some cases, they are not. I mean, the, have you seen anything that companies can systematically do to, in the presence of these questions, screen through the clutter and figure out what is the right decision, particularly in a world where people are attracted to confirmatory analysis? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I actually think it's entirely possible. But it takes hard work. You can't, you can't assume. First of all, the toughest challenge is, and I have this in my, in my own consulting work, is to talk to a CEO or a board and, and have them believe that they are actually uh, fallible in the first place. Right? That's the biggest problem right there. Uh, I have to convince them that they are human beings. That's really what I'm saying. Uh, it shouldn't be that tough, but it happens. Uh, and once we got past that stage, uh, it's not a tough argument to share you know, where this stuff came from. I didn't make it up. It's based on you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of people have done the underlying research. Uh, uh, it's hard to, it, it, when confronted with, um, if somebody's open-minded, you've got to start with that. If you're not, it doesn't work. Um, and then um, 
uh, and, then, and then you share the data uh, that indicate, look at all these things that could happen and have happened, uh, would you think it's a good idea to spend a little bit of time thinking this through? Now, you say it a little bit more cleverly, perhaps, than I did if, they're, if you're the advisor to that person. Uh, but if you're not open-minded to start with, you, 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 right? And in fact, that's kind of a catch-22 in all this, because this is about being open-minded in the first place. Um, so, you know, um, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of like uh, therapy. You know, therapy doesn't work on anyone if they don't want it to work on them. And this is not much different in that, in that respect. So I think, I think it's possible. I'm not deluding myself, believing it's easy, because it's not. Um, but when, when I'm dealing with um, executives or CEOs or boards that really want to um, get better, they care about this, uh, they, they give this a very fair uh, hearing. They do. Yeah. But it's hard work even after you get to that stage. It's not, it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Yeah? I'm titillated by your reference to neuroscience, and I can see where it would explain these things, but I'm wondering, um, did your research find anything where there was some indicated neurochemical basis for open-mindedness and self-awareness? Mm -hmm. Wow, I like to find, I like to bottle that and sell it. <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't see anything about that. I mean, if there is, it would be a fantastic thing to know about. Yeah, uh, and you know that's maybe why we keep doing research on these. Things. Wouldn't that be great to figure that out? Because we're finding actually, and I think this is behind your question, more and more genetic bases to all sorts of behavior that we never imagined, right? And maybe this is one of them. I have, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In your M&A chart and the, the diminishing returns on yeah, that's a happy chart. Uh, is there something structural that you found that you might recommend to companies that are engaged in a lot of M&A activity to, to try to alter that? Experience? Well, sure. Let let me play uh, let me play professor and ask the class if this is the red pattern is the way it looks right. If that's an accurate and I think it is depiction of reality, what would you do if you were either an advisor to the CEO or a CEO contemplating growing through acquisition? <laughs> and he was a tuck scholar. <laughs> um, in fact, yeah, that's a good idea. Why, why jump into it with a multi-billion dollar acquisition? Uh, start small because you're investing as you're going along. So that's one. Yeah, any other ideas? Right. People that have the experience and they can train the people that don't have the experience. So assemble a team that has the experience and it's not a bad idea to, to, to steal some talent from people, from companies that have gotten further down the line. But I wouldn't go too far on that because every company is the same and there's a lot of nuance that's company specific in terms of the experience. So you want a balance of that. So I think that makes sense. Uh, and I'll go a little further with that, which is uh, make it your business to collect the data as you're going along and keep the talent involved in M&A integration and strategy and all the rest. Uh, and over time, build up that capability. I call it an M&A capability. So I think if, if, if we're very purposeful right from the beginning, recognizing this is a long haul, uh, on average it's a long haul, we'll, we'll invest the money it takes to build the team um, and, and assemble the talent and start to analyze acquisitions in real time so that we can get that body of knowledge. I think that's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. I was interested, you, uh, you're talking about a lot of uh, decisions where things are straightforward and then you brought in uh, basically fraud. And uh, I, I would suggest that fraud can be a little bit different uh, or maybe fall partly outside that matrix in that uh, people who commit fraud find various ways to uh, a, get you to suspend your disbelief, to prevent you from doing due diligence by invoking <coughs> various kinds of oath helpers. I'm aligned with religion. Uh, I, am, I, I know important people. You know, all of those kinds of things. I, I eat it loose. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, they also are excellent at misdirection. So uh, you think, oh, I'm investing in this big deal. And if you if you did your due diligence, you'll find, oh, this is about this is about a twenty-five thousand dollar fee that this guy can walk away with, uh, and it's not about two billion dollars to to uh, build Aussie World in uh, New Jersey, which is an actual fraud that, that I try to deter people from investing in. 
So there's your techniques to keep right. you. I think it's a great point. It, it's a great point. And, uh, and that's what makes it so easy to fall into the attachment trap, if you will. Right? And so actually what I would say is, while well, that no doubt is true, maybe even more so, right? Um, from the individual making a decision, let's say in this example, to invest or not to invest, it is from that individual's point of view that exactly this type of thinking would be or could be helpful, right? Uh, um, are, am I getting attached to this person that's drawing me into his web in the, way, in the way that you described? Whether it's fraud or whether it's anything else, for any individual thinking about making a decision, it's the, uh, some of the same questions still, still are useful. Yeah. Yeah. Time for maybe one or, one or two? Sure. Why not? Yes. I'm the, the son of a comrade, uh, and I'm unaccustomed to the, I guess I don't know the details of the situation with Yahoo, but my question would be, it seems that you're making the assumption that losing $30, $30 billion is, is therefore a poor decision. I'm just wondering, in other circumstances, wouldn't there be other factors in, in addition to money that would contribute to whether that would be a good decision or a bad decision, such as protecting the environment or taking care of employees, whereas boiling that decision just down to money might leave us susceptible to sort of analysis that's not complete. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. There are multiple criteria to decide whether a decision is a good one. I think in the case of Yahoo, as far as I know, there's not really an environmental or employee side of the type that you're, you're alluding to. And so in the case of Yahoo, 30 billion speaks pretty strongly. Uh, but in other situations, um, uh, absolutely. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that we can decide something is good or bad just on the basis of, of whether it makes you a lot of money or not. It's obviously important. Um, yeah. In the case of Yahoo, I think that's, those, are not, those are not issues, but I think in general, yes. Yeah. Yes. With your recent search committee experience, were you able to bring this to the table and uh, help the committee members perhaps see through their own biases, <laughs> challenge their as a matter of fact, yes. Uh, uh, I, uh, without uh, kind of ha having a heavy hand saying I did this research and that's, that, that's how I just asked questions like this when we were getting, when we were narrowing it down um, and starting to all coalesce in a certain direction. I asked whether we were making some prejudgments here and what, what other data should we look at. I, I, I asked all of, these, all of these questions. And it turns out I wasn't the only one asking these questions. Other people in the committee were very um, diligent in wanting to make sure we, we, we got it as right as we could. Um, and so there was a lot of um, um, checking. In fact, I think, in, I think someone in the committee called it a, uh, they talked about the, the, the black hat technique. Uh, I never heard it quite spoken that way, but basically someone, it's a devil's advocate type of approach, right? Is that, is that where that comes from? Yeah, the, okay. the has six thinking hats and the black one is getting filled up. So th that's exactly what we were doing and I was using some of these questions. Others were using quite similar types of thinking. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, to some extent it wasn't worth $30 billion for Jerry Yang to say no to Steve Ballmer. I mean, that was a piece of the motivation was to almost reject the offer. And the question I have with that is, did you see any, see any correlation between the size of the decision and the application of this kind of critical thinking Meaning, in some cases, a bigger decision results in a poor decision-making process, even though you think that would not necessarily be the case. I see what you're saying. Yeah, so a more complex decision could lead to more difficult, or you said bigger, really, but so a bigger decision, more at stake, could lead to a, 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 a more difficult result. Yeah, and um, I think that's, uh, I, I think in the absence of anything else, uh, Absolutely, that's going to happen because those bigger decisions are more complex. There's more stuff going, along, going around. It's not the striped animal bounding towards us at all. It's a little bit more difficult than that. Um, uh, and so, in fact, the more you got on the table, the more you, ha you have at risk, the more important it is to do this kind of step, this step back. So I think that's right. Well, from that perspective, why does it cost us something to do this if people don't seem to make that animal with investment? Is there a sort of essential yeah. quality that or factor that comes through that says, you know, a big decision, people just, because it's so complex, they rely on the gut. I, yeah. I don't know. You know, um, uh, I'm sure the neuroscientists have talked about that a little bit, but I, uh, I'll, I'll, answer, uh, I'll answer that question in, in, in this way, by referring to one of the greatest management books ever written, uh, which, uh, which was by a guy named, uh, um, I forgot his first name, Parkinson, Parkinson's Law, that was it. Do you remember that? Parkinson's Law, it was written in the 50s, I think. Um, Parkinson's Law, 
was uh, uh, all work expands to fulfill the time available for its completion. <laughs> all work expands to fulfill the time available for its completion. It's pretty, pretty good. In any event, he has a lot of other laws in there. And one chapter talks about decision making. And he talks about uh, a board of directors that had a, uh, had a bunch of things on the agenda. And the first thing on the agenda was the coffee machine. I mean, that's right, the coffee machine. Which coffee, we need to replace the coffee machine. Which one should we use? And everyone had an opinion about that because everyone understood the problem. And they had a long debate, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, analyzing this. And finally, they decided to go in a particular direction. The next item on the agenda was whether to build a nuclear plant. <laughs> Nobody had a clue about that one. And so they just decided quickly, sure, let's do it. Now, this was written in tongue in cheek. I don't know how much real data was behind it, but it illustrates that that sometimes happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? In a capitalist economy, is greed good? Are we out of time, Andy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will say, Unbridled greed that hurts many other people is wrong, morally wrong. That's how I would put it. That's my view. Yes? So self-interest is, is, can lead you astray. Yeah. But that's very difficult in the capitalist economy where we're all, where we're all hardwired to self-interest. Uh, well, that's true in any e economy. Anyone's been to China will be fully aware of self-interest in action every day. Uh, so it's not just cap it's people. Yeah, hu humans, it's, pe it's people. Well, and after all, evolution tells us it's common sense, you know, survival of the fittest and all the other things we know from Darwin and, and others. Yeah. Yes, in the back. sort of tend to neglect, and it's not captured in, within one of these uh, four factors, that you tend to neglect the worst case and the negative uh, payout in front of positive outcome and a high probability of a uh, positive outcome without any of these factors. So you're sort of dancing on the high wire. You're the star if you make it, but if you fall, you're dead. And that's something you can't tolerate. You can't be that. That's the end of it. But still, you just don't want to see that because if you make it through the high wire, you're you're fine. And it's not your personal self-interest. It's it's a risk taking, but it's a risk taking without neglecting the negative outcome. It's not one of these four factors. Do you see? So let's see if we, uh, if we understand. So risk taking, um, where there's big risk on the table, uh, but when it, when when it's well thought out. Oh, yeah, and you ignore what could go wrong. Yes, you ignore oh. essentially the worst case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, um, uh, Matthew Broderick ignored what was going wrong in real time, actually, right? Well, maybe, but you, you, you know how I'd look at it? I'd, I'd ask the question, well, why is this person ignoring all the things that might go wrong? Why, why is that happening? There's, a, there, there's some uh, people uh, in economics, uh, very well-known, Kahneman and Tversky, that maybe you know about that, that dealt with exactly that problem. And they came up with uh, the idea of loss aversion, which is that people hate losses more than they like gains. Um, and that influences, uh, and that's hardwired into the brain, actually. I don't know, can't tell you why, but that is. And it's been found in numerous experiments. And it might very well be that that's the case. Um, sometimes we do ignore what could go wrong. Other times we value it too highly. Um, and so we don't actually act because we're afraid. Both of those things are, are possible. Why, why does that happen? Um, uh, I think it happens in, in part because of self-interest. Uh, but why do, why are people, why are people, uh, why do people sometimes value losses um, in, in a really great and very, in, in, in a huge magnitude versus, versus lower magnitude? A lot of research on entrepreneurs has found that, for example, entrepreneurs don't think they're taking risks that most of us will say are huge risks. Um, because they've thought it through, they figured it out, they've got a comfort level with that. So there's a lot of variation, I think, uh, among, 
among people. You know, I'm not saying this explains everything, to be sure, but there's a lot of variation. And the other thing, last thing I'll say about this, um, when you think about kind of a payoff matrix, all of us probably have done something like this. You know, we have five choices, and uh, let's identify, you know, six criteria on what we should do uh, uh, that are important, and then we, we give a score. So five choices, six criteria, we got a five by six matrix, and we plug in the numbers. If we're hyper-analytical, we will do something like that. I actually did that once, uh, a long time ago. Uh, I did it when uh, I was thinking about what uh, graduate school to, uh, to go to. Uh, and I had been accepted all over the place at a law school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So law school, uh, MBA, PhD program, um, and an economics uh, program in, um, in England. And I did a whole thing, and it, ca and it came out in a way I didn't like. <laughs> so. What I decided is I needed to rebalance the weightings a little bit. <laughs> and I did, and I ended up with the result I wanted. <laughs> and off to London I went, so there you go. Thank you.